OK, in this video I'd like to continue on with my tutorials discussing complex analysis. Specifically this is video number 3 and it is my second derivation of Green's theorem. I'd like to draw your attention to my website universityphysicstutorials.com. Here I have all my videos archived and listed and I have also a few other bits and pieces which may be of interest to you. Before we begin I'd like to recap on the previous videos which are relevant. I did a series of four videos discussing complex numbers in the past and in, ad in addition to that I did a video on complex numbers in 10 minutes or discussed complex numbers in 10 minutes. In video one of complex analysis I discussed the Cauchy-Riemann conditions or the Cauchy-Riemann equations. In video two in complex analysis I discussed the derivation of Green's theorem and I did that essentially using first principles. However, in this particular video, number 3, I'm going to build upon video number 1 and use the cauchy riemann equations. So, the cauchy riemann conditions are written in front of you. These are for a path-independent complex derivative. This is where our function is made up of a real component and an imaginary component, u and v, and each of those are a function of x and y. What we're going to do is use Stokes' theorem and see if we can come up with Green's theorem using these Cauchy-Riemann conditions. We have an unambiguous complex derivative where the Cauchy-Riemann conditions are satisfied. However, we don't know if integration is unambiguous. So is integration path independent when we talk about complex numbers or a number with a both real and an imaginary component. This is basically what Green's theorem is all about. Let's consider an arbitrary complex number z. We're going to say that z is a function of u and v, each of which is a function of x and y. So we can say that f is equal to u plus i times v, where u is the real component and v is the imaginary component each of which is a function of both x and y. Let's consider the exact same closed curve as we did in video number 2, where we went from x min equal to a, x max equal to b. We split the curve up into two separate components, namely c1, which is y1 of x, and c2, which is y2 of x. So c, which is a function of z, which of course therefore is a function of u and v, which of course therefore is a function of x and y. We define a positive curve as going anti-clockwise. So just to say it one more time, we break up the path C into two smaller paths, namely C1 and C2, Y1 of x and Y2 of x, and we join them so that their sum is equal to C. Of course, for path independence, going by C1 and C2 should be irrelevant. Mathematically, we can establish this by saying that f of z dz integrated along C1 has to be minus f of z dz integrated along C2. Of course we can rewrite this and see that their sum is zero. This means that for conservative force fields, the closed line integral of a force field, a conservative force field, is equal to zero. And this is very important, you should know this from your physics. The closed line integral of a conservative force field is zero. Earlier we noted that f is equal to u plus i times v. So let's plug this into our expression. So we say that f is, or excuse me, z is equal to u plus iv and we have dx plus i dy is equal to dz. As I said in video number 2, Green's theorem only works or is only valid for closed curves, closed line integrals. If we multiply these two expressions and group the real and imaginary components, we get u dx minus v dy and v dx minus u dy. These of course have to be equal to zero. They have to be equal to zero separately in order to have uh, in order to have independence, and as a result, we have two different integrals. Now, using the notation in the past, we could have l dx at m dy, 
and I'm going to call this one here L prime dx and M prime dy. Now there's no relationship between L and M, uh, excuse me, L and L prime, M and M prime. It's just, I'm using, that's the notation I'm going to use. So each of these must be equal to zero separately. We know of course that R is equal to Li hat plus Mj hat plus zero K hat. This is something we saw in video number two where we say R is the more general vector field having both an I and a J hat component. DR is of course DX I hat plus DY J hat plus DZ K hat. Let's first look at the integral, the closed surface, excuse me, the closed line integral of LDX plus MDY. This can easily be rewritten as a dot product of LI hat plus MJ hat with dr. And that's because of course k hat dot zero is equal to zero. So we can have the, the you could e you could easily have uh, you could have lm you might have n k hat here if you want it where n is equal to zero. Now I'm not going to derive Stokes theorem. If it's something you're familiar with well then that's great. And if it's not you can look at video number two for a derivation of Green's theorem. But I've written Stokes theorem at the bottom of your screen. Stokes theorem allows us to go from a closed line integral to a surface integral or we go to a surface integral but involves the curl of a vector field. Now I don't want to get too uh, bogged down in the vector calculus. You can check my section, video section on vector calculus for electromagnetism if you would like to know more. So here what we have is R is equal to L i hat plus M j hat and D L is well D R. You can see video number 32 in my series of videos on vector calculus for electromagnetism for more about Stokes theorem. Note that the curve C is in the x y plane and that D A is the vector area. So D A will say the scalar D A is just the, is just the area the vector dA is the scalar area but with a direction perpendicular to the, uh, the surface of the, the area. So say for example if, if you had the scalar area dA here it would be equal to dx dy but the vector area is going to be equal to dx dy k hat. Now in order to employ or invoke Stokes theorem we need to do the curl. We need to take the curl of the vector field R. So let's go ahead and do that. This is most easily done through matrices where you take the determinant of the 3x3 three three matrix written in the center of your screen. So I've rewritten Stokes theorem here and this is the curl of our uh, this is the curl of our vector field R here or this is about also about to compute the curl and I've written the curl of the vector field here. I don't want to get bogged down in the algebra, it's something I'm sure you can, you can compute yourself. The point to note here is that we're taking the curl and then we're taking the dot product of that with the vector area. But the vector area dA is equal to dx dy k hat. So putting it all together the dot product is going to give us 0 plus 0 plus del, e, del or sub y del x minus del or sub x del y dx dy. That of course is because we're taking the dot product with something which is only in the k hat direction which kills the i hat and j hat components. This should start to look quite familiar. This means if we have an arbitrary vector field in two dimensions, which we call R, we take the closed line integral of that dl, that's equivalent to getting the surface integral or the double integral of del r sub y del x minus del r sub x del y, integrated dx dy. That of course is equal to zero. In our previous nomenclature, R is equal to l i hat plus m j hat or r sub x is equal to l and r sub y is equal to m. But we need to remember 
that we started with two integrals, one involving the real components and one involving the imaginary components. Thus far we've only worked on the real components L and M and that gave us this expression here. Of course something similar happens with the imaginary components L prime and M prime here. And what we've now gotten is Green's theorem going from a closed line integral to a surface integral. That's all I've got to say about that. Thanks for watching. Please pass it on to your friends. Subscribe to my YouTube channel. You might click out or check out universityphysicstutorials.com. Thank you for watching.